Okay. Uh, hey, everybody. Um, I have just been told I have, have to do a quick memory test on Benrex CV. Right, let's so let's see what I can do. Uh, he used to be faculty at UW Madison, and now he's at Berkeley. Uh, ML superstar, one of the most high energy people I've ever met. <laughs> tons and tons of papers. Uh, amazing blog called Argman. Uh, foundational work in matrix completion, which won him a Lagrange prize. Test of time award for random kitchen sinks. Is that, I don't know if that's your name or not, but yeah, yeah. I like Test it. of time I like award it. at NeurIPS last year, so like most influential paper in the last 10 years. What else is there? It's good. I think that's all I can come up with for now. Mostly true. Yeah. All right, well, now mostly we have to, true. Now we have to meet. Okay, let, let's I really thank Ben. It's, it's great to have you. Anyway, putting people on the spot. <laughs> it's good. All right, well, thank you guys for inviting me. It's really fun to be here in Vancouver, one of my favorite cities in the world. I always forget, and I kind of like, oh, I love it here. So it's great. I forgot to say hog wild. Hog wild. And then yeah. you talk about, and I'm not, not going to talk about any of these things that Mark talked about there. This is cool. So I want to talk about reinforcement learning, sort of. Or, I mean, what do I want to talk about? First, I want to talk about how all of this work is done with some amazing people from Berkeley. Uh, and it's been a kind of about three year investigation, maybe four now, deep dive into this space that I still am offending people by not talking about the right stuff. And I'm offending people both on the machine learning side and the control side. So if you're offended, that's my fault. But if you think something's cool, that's due to one of these people. Uh, <laughs> maybe more than one. Uh, and so I think the, 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 I got interested in these issues of reinforcement learning because we've had some just tremendous advances in autonomy in, in recent years. We have walking robots doing parkour-like tricks, self-driving cars that are supposed to that have been, that are gonna happen next year, or this have been supposedly happening next year for the last five years. Um, <laughs> Uh, and like we're getting to new new levels of being able to incorporate um, all sorts of perceptual kind of um, vi visual cues into robotic systems. I mean, it's really cool. Like these are the kind of things that like, sure probably come out of sci-fi movies. But if you talk to anyone who works in robotics or automation and about these videos, what they will tell you is that if they make these videos, if you see one of these videos, you do not see the first 9,999 takes. You get the one take that works, usually then you turn the camera off. And indeed, all of this stuff actually is still really in a kind of weird state where, yeah, we can get good demos, but can we get stuff that's reliable? And while these things are funny, and I really love the robot falling over, it's hilarious when you guys you really empathize with our friend from Boston Dynamics, the Atlas falling over. When, I mean, I, it's Mondays. Um, the hard part is that when that's happening in self-driving cars, there are really big consequences, right? So if we have this thing where we get rationally excited and we start to push things into production, that aren't maybe ready for production, people, people's lives are in the mix. And I think that's really the part where it becomes, uh, becomes really challenging. So, so it's the kind of thing where we, I think to really make this stuff happen, we have to understand how to make things reliable, trustable, and safe. And so even though we've mastered the game of Go, and we've started to show that robots can do stuff from cameras, we are not at the scale yet where we can really automate machine learning system, well, I mean, we're deploying machine learning systems at very large scales, but I don't know if we trust them to run our power grid um, and to really be driving cars with people in the mix. And so that's really the question, is how do we get there to this place where machine learning that interacts with the physical world is something that we trust, that we depend on, and that we think is reliable. And so in some sense, this is how we got into reinforcement learning in the first place. The idea was reinforcement learning, as I was told at Berkeley, is this field where you uh, study how to use past data to enhance the future manipulation of some kind of dynamical system. Um, and when people were telling me this, and I was kind of distilling this, I was looking at that. Yeah, can I just ask real quick, how many people are from the CS department? How many people are from a different department? Okay. Oh, there's, there's a little bit of, there's a little bit of cross culture. So some people from the other departments might say, wait a minute. We, we had a different name for that before 2012, right? Or, or depending on how long you've been involved in reinforcement learning. And so before, uh, before everybody learned about Go, there was a different way to, or at least a different kind of set of strategies 
to study how to use past data to enhance the future manipulation of a dynamical system. And the question is, like, what's, what's the difference here? And which tools are actually right for these jobs? And what is different about control theory uh, versus reinforcement learning? Um, how do these tools play together? How do we actually make sense of something that would, it, there probably are ideas from both camps that we could put together into something uh, that gets us towards the systems we want. So what's machine learning? Maybe not reinforcement learning necessarily, but what's machine learning when you think about it? I think in general machine learning is about using data to learn to act. To be fair, a lot of people who teach machine learning usually it's learning to predict. So we say now that machine learning is about learning to take actions. That's reinforcement learning. But most of the time we just do predictions. But let's, well, we're going to come back to see why that will be important in a bit. It, but why would we use it? The main idea we use it is because we can use function approximation in data to simplify a lot of tasks where we have very complex environments, where we have very complex sensing modalities, or perhaps that we have models that are so complex that even simulating them seems hard. And so the idea of machine learning is that we could actually just use the data itself, be very data driven, to kind of simplify these tasks when you have a lot of complexity. Controls, on the other hand, is usually supposed to be using feedback to mitigate the effects of uncertainty. Right? So controls is less about, even though we want to use it in complex environments, it's really about mitigating uncertainty. And so if you have very uncertain environments where, where you're trying to fly airplanes, you would like to actually use feedback to correct for these models. A lot of times your sensors themselves are uncertain. So controls would hope to be able to correct for the uncertainty in, in those sensors. And models are almost always uncertain. Right? As we know, all models are wrong, but some are useful. So how I actually make that a, a, a practical um, mantra is kind of part of what controls study. And so how, the question is, how do you get the both of these detailed controlled models and machine learning and big data? And what I want to do today is maybe not even figure out how to get the both, but how do we put them in the same footing? And I'm just going to use optimization as a way to tie these two together. Just because that's really what I know. That's the only thing I feel very comfortable with, is <laughs> optimization. Um, and so, so how, how, or how do we like make these things optimization? When you dig down into both the problems that reinforcement learning solves and the problems that most uh, <laughs> controls solve, uh, more often than not, you have a box. That box has some inputs, and it has some state. And the goal is to understand the behavior of this, usually to move the state to some position that you would like it to be in. Okay, so the state is just. Some, actually, all it is is it's a list of numbers. And if you know those numbers, you can predict the future. That's what a state is. An input is just the set of knobs that you get to turn, or the, the kind of things that you can apply to try to influence that state. And the question is, how do we actually make this do something? The way we make this do something, there's lots of different strategies. But what kind of unified perspective is to pose an optimization problem. And so this, is, this slide is heavy with a lot of notation, but this is all the notation we want to use today. So we want to pose an optimization problem. You want to minimize something. So in particular, what we try to do is minimize costs. And in controls, you always minimize costs. Tracking error, um, the, the, you want to minimize the, uh, the size of a disturbance. You want to minimize some kind of um, bad heading. There are lots of things you might want to minimize. What's interesting is in reinforcement learning, I guess the main difference between reinforcement learning and control is they only maximize, and they maximize reward. So there's, there's control theorists are eternal pessimists. <laughs> Reinforcement learning people are eternal optimists. And it actually, I mean, I think it's, it's funny, but Ben Van Roy uh, really believes, and I, I think he's right, that that actually points to a very profound difference between the two fields. Reinforcement learning never takes no for an answer. This is why you go chase Go, you chase video games, you chase these things that get progressively harder. Controls is like, that sounds crazy. <laughs> Let's do something simpler. And that, those two attitudes really fight against each other. Um, I'm not, but that's not wrong, right? I'm in my control theory special. Okay, good. <laughs> so, so here, what we have here, we have the state and the input. I also added something called noise, because we want to have disturbances. So E's are our errors or our disturbances. F is the thing that maps the, current, the present to the future. Uh, tau is a trajectory. That's just the data that we're going to use to influence the future. So there's all the past inputs in states. And then pi of t is called a policy. And this is, I take the past, I put it together, and I output my next action. That's the decision variable. Now, this, this, my notation is controls notation, not reinforcement learning notation. And reinforcement learning notation, instead of having x for state, they use s for state, which makes a lot more sense, to be fair. <laughs> and, uh, and instead of u, they use a for action. Also makes sense. I don't know where the x and u comes from, but this is what I grew up with, so I stick with it. Uh, so in case you are, I've never seen 
how you set one of these problems up. I want to actually do this example, and it's useful for stuff down the line. So let's say we have a quad rotor, and we want to move the quad rotor from A to B. How do you do that? So we have to set up, first of all, let's understand what is the dynamics that governs this model? What, how does the, the future map to the, uh, uh, sound going out. Yeah. HDMI cable. Safety first, but anyway, there's the answer. Yeah, New Newton's laws. Newton's laws govern. I mean, the, the simplest version of this is up in the air already. Everything's nice. Uh, we're just going to move this by Newton's laws, right? And so Newton's laws again for that. Position is uh, uh, the derivative of position is velocity. So the old position, is, the new position is the old position plus your velocity. Your, your velocity gets updated by the acceleration, and f equals n a. So if you apply a force, the thing moves proportional to the mass. And I could write this as a bunch of matrix equations. Right? So the, the state update is a matrix times the old state plus a matrix times the input. The input here is the force. And maybe what I'm going to do is minimize the amount of time it takes me to get to the dot. So I'm just going to count. You're going to pay a penalty of 1 if you're not on the dot. You pay a penalty of 0 if you're on the dot. Okay. That's a simple optimal control problem, very simple to write down. And I've stacked here. x is now just the position and the velocity. The state is not just the position. Because if I want to predict the future, I need both the position and the velocity. Um, now, I can't, so this is actually something that's interesting from the machine learning perspective. Sorry, my animation got messed up. Uh, this looks hard. I have this thing that's this like binary discrete variable. Maybe I could solve it. The HTML kid really is walking. Uh, but maybe what I could do instead uh, of uh, minimizing that thing that's discrete is I could do a surrogate cost. And we do this in machine learning all the time. And actually, this is something we're used to. In machine learning, we start with a problem we'd like to solve. And then we keep changing the problem until we can solve it. So once, you can, once you can go into TensorFlow, you, then, you're, then you're good to go. Um, but that's not bad, right? I mean, that's part of design. Part of the design is shaping the optimization problem so you can solve it and then evaluating it somewhere else. Like, for example, you want to minimize classification error. If you don't minimize classification error, you minimize, say, a softmax loss, which you can differentiate, which you can optimize. And then you evaluate it on the classification error. The same is true in control. And maybe I could even add something which penalizes the, the amount of force I apply. And now I have a problem which is easy to solve because it is a convex quadratic function subject to linear constraints. And so if you solve this, you, there's a couple of things that are interesting. First, yeah, you want to get to 0 the shortest amount of time possible. But the, the way that you get to 0 will change based on the cost function. So I can tune the amount of uh, um, emphasis I have on minimizing the input size. That will make it take you longer to get to 0. But you, you have two, two features. One, you use considerably less force to get there. Uh, you never have these giant jumps in your force. That, so when r is small, you have a giant jump. Otherwise, it's small. And uh, you overshoot um, the, the 0. You don't. If you have applied too much force, you're going to go way over here, and then you might have to oscillate back and forth. Why are you talking about over? Who knows? Who knows? Something weird is happening. But that's fine. Uh, maybe don't touch it. What? Don't touch it. I didn't touch it, though. Oh, okay. The platform. The platform. I know. I, I, I didn't, didn't touch it. He didn't go last either. Last time it just yeah. went off. Oh, great. Right. Just don't, don't look at it. Don't look at the screen. You're <laughs> fine. <laughs> All right. So that's it. That, like, what I also like about this is this gives me like a general purpose, simplest example. And this is the, the way I like about this problem is this is the simplest optimal control problem I know how to write down. It's quadratic cost, linear constraints, linear dynamics. And it's powerful enough to be the backbone of a lot of different kinds of control systems. Out in the wild, there are lots of things that run linear quadratic regulators. Um, but it's also something that we could hopefully analyze and allow us to really start to understand how machine learning comes into the picture. And in particular, I haven't talked about learning at all. This is just dynamical systems. Where does machine learning enter? Um, yeah, layer dynamics, quadratic costs. Machine learning enters when you start to have uh, either complexity or some kind of uh, something you have to learn. So what? there are lots of things we can have to learn. One simple example is what happens if I don't know the dynamical model? Either I believe it's too hard to simulate, or I would say maybe I don't even know it, and I would just like to get, run some experiments to get this thing up and running. And so the challenge is, how do you actually do optimal control when I don't know the dynamics of the system? Okay. It's, a fairly, it's, a, it's a reasonable question, but now, now the question is, oh, you have to do something. Right? We get into this exploration, exploitation, and trade-off kind of situation. So how, how would you do it? And let me motivate this with an example, uh, with an example that also points to the difference between reinforcement learning and control. Um, 
this is a picture of Google's data centers, and this is a picture of the system that's used to cool the data centers. Because when you run too many GPUs, the computers get very hot. You got to keep that room cool. And you want to keep that room cool in a way that's energy efficient and green. It's a good problem. Now, uh, again, DeepMind had a big, a big press uh, barrage talking about how they use reinforcement learning to cool the data centers. And it was cool. I think it was, like, I read about it in the New York Times. Um, if you were a control theorist, the first thing would be you go and visit them, and they would say, "Oh, let's talk about that. We did, you know, we call this. We've been studying this for a while. It's called air conditioning." <laughs> <laughs> and then, you know, nothing happens. But it would probably work. It would work fine, and no one would know. And that would be the end of the story. So it is this weird thing. So we're, uh, control theorists also really much worse at PR uh, <laughs> than their reinforcement learning counterparts. So how would you solve this, right? So the like really naive thing, and I actually heard someone from DMind trying to propose this as a straw man, was that you would do a finite element model of your data center. No control theorists would do this. There's absolutely no reason to do it. And then like use the finite element model as part of your control strategy. What would you actually do? You would probably take what you learned in your junior year uh, thermodynamics class and learn about heat transfer. And you would just build a bulk model that would model different parts, different units, much simpler, ends up having some, some, some much simpler dynamics. Um, and so you have a coarse model that approximates the behavior, but approximates it well enough to make predictions to change the outcome. Um, and then there's the machine learning approach, right? What the machine learning approach is, I just look at the sensors, and I know the sensors should be somewhere else, and so I have had people running the data center for five years before I got there, I look at all the stuff that they did and then try to just learn a map from what the sensors were to what action they took. And so I have mechanical Turk workers, also known as the people running the Google Data Center, and I use their actions to actually train the model. Which of these is right? We know that the first one is ridiculous. You don't need to do the first one, but of these two, like really, how do you know which is right? What's the right way to actually interact with the system and get it up and running? And so right, you have, the, you have this identify everything paradigm to have really high precision which you don't need for data centers, but you do need for airplanes. So there are cases when you actually do have to do high performance, um, high performance models, high fidelity models. Um, on the other hand, for a lot of things, like, like air conditioning, you might identify a coarse model, and this kind of would underlie what people would call model predictive control. For the most part, when you do model predictive control, you have fairly coarse models of the system, but are able to actually do um, very complex um, control. And then there's a, like the very nihilistic version where it's like I don't need models at all. And in this case, this is, this is roughly like there's a, so here's the thing. This is Berkeley reinforcement learning because we have we have other people who've worked in reinforcement learning before know that reinforcement learning is fine with models. But there's a particular Silicon Valley view of the world where you just don't need them. And, uh, and, this, is, and this is what unfortunately where I was I learned about it for the first time. So. I, my bad. But in any event, so there's this model-free reinforcement learning case where it just says that I can just learn maps from inputs to outputs. But then there's also, what I think was interesting is there's a control version of this, which is PID control. And in case you haven't heard about it, 95% of all control systems that are out in, in production right now, at least 95%, that time was touching, <laughs> at least 95% um, are, are, are PID. Actually, no, truthfully, 95% are PI, original <laughs> integral. You don't even need the D. Although in robotics they do PD, it depends on what you mean. What are these letters? What are these letters? One mean, it's really cool. PID control is just, I have a signal I want to track, I look at my error, and then my control law, the, the U, is just a, it's a sum of, some linear combination of the error, so that's proportional, the integral of the error, and the derivative of the error. Some combination of those three. And uh, some combination of those three is, suffices for a huge number of tasks. But as you want, the question then is like, so, so how do you go from these simple things to these much more complicated things um, is the big question that we have to try to figure out. <laughs> See, got me there. So now we got back to, now we got back to this. So what's the right thing to do? How do we compare these things? And I'm gonna try to reinvent RL thinking about this particular problem of I don't know the dynamics. This is only one aspect of reinforcement learning, but it kind of allows us to kind of get at all the kind of heart of what people do. So if you really look, so let's, let's pose a problem. I want to figure out what's the most efficient way to actually get this thing up and running. So I'm going to assume that you're allowed to run n trajectories, gather n trajectories, each of them about length t. And then from this, I'm going to say, build the controller that has as close to optimal performance as possible. Under what policy? You can, whatever policy you want. You can do anything, any inputs you want. Um, but you get to, well, but you have to pick them. I can tell you anything about f, so I could maybe pick a bad f for you. 
but you get to do whatever you'd like to try. But you get to run n of them at length t. And then I want to say, what's the smallest error you can get out? And so what's the optimal thing to do here? And like, how many samples do you actually need to, for, for optimal control in this setting? Again, we're assuming we don't know f. Now, if I do it, not knowing f, this is too general. So we have to get something simpler. What's the simpler version of this problem? And again, for the simpler version, I'm going to go back to the quadratic case. Before I do that, let me just tell you what the approaches are. Right? What are the basically, basically competing approaches? So there's more, but I roughly, a very coarse view of the world of things is there are things that don't use models. And um, probably the most popular version of things that don't use models are called direct policy search. Popular, I mean, things that people use to run for games and um, I don't know, stuff, stuff I see uh, uh, demos of. The second one, it's going to come back. There it is. It's cool if I click forward, it comes back. Something weird's happening there. Uh, the, the second one is approximate dynamic programming, which is set, instead of actually trying to directly optimize a policy, tries to come up with a cost that's a, a reasonable surrogate for the whole problem, even though I don't know the Fs. right? Because the total cost actually depends on both the Fs and the Cs. And then there's this other thing, which is called model-based control, where we fit model from data. This is actually what we used to call this. We, we fit the model to the data and then do optimal control. Um, this one I like a lot, model-based RL, because like the other two require, I, I gave tutorials on these, at ICML and the Compass on Robotic Learning. So you guys can go check those out if you want more details on those. But model-based RL fits on a slide. So what you do is you collect some simulation data, usually with ra like in the controls books, they tell you to collect it with random inputs, which I don't know if you necessarily, I would necessarily advise binary, huh? Random binary. Random binary inputs, which you, you know sometimes you're not allowed to do because you're going to break the machine. So you got to be careful. But still, uh, you do it. Random binary inputs, and now we think that we should have some model. I fit a least squares estimate of the model somehow, just predicting the future. And then I just solve an approximation of the original problem I cared about with this fit model, the phi that's supposed to be approximating f. Right? This is kind of so model-based control more or less falls into this category. Frank's so upset with me. That's okay. You get you. What else would you add? He's going to tumble there. It's fine. <laughs> but that's, that's, that's half of it, OK? And a lot of times, you know a lot about f, and all you're doing is identifying parameters. right? So throwing out the full structure of f, it, you don't even have to do. You just want to identify some parameters. Um, so my, I think the real takeaway here is that model-based RL is a very simple approach. And the other thing I always want to emphasize is that model, to, to my machine learning friends, is models enable a lot of stuff. They let you be modular. They let you naturally understand robustness to the, how, how your predictions change the outcomes. Um, they let you invalidate. They, you, know, you can invalidate models. You can really understand a lot about science. They let you do design and planning. Um, they let you do, and they make it a little bit easier to incorporate safety constraints. So what I was going to say, I think the real important part about the next part of this talk is that if you're going to throw away models, you really have to give me something powerful. I want, if you want to convince me that we're going to do something without models, you have to convince me that I'm winning on some, some level. What do I buy? Because I'm losing a lot giving it away models. And so the question is, what do you win? And so the way to get back to this is we go back to, this is my, my, my uh, I guess, the machine learning ethos. This is not a theorem or an axiom or anything. This is just something I believe personally. So this is my religion. It's called the linearization principle, which is that if you have a machine learning algorithm and you tell me it's amazing, and then we go and apply it to linear regression. And it does something really dumb. My guess is that it's doing something really dumb on the problem you started with. Now that's, I can't prove that. <laughs> I can't prove that. This is, just a, this is just like my, that's my gut check. That's just what I want to do. This is like my, I want the sanity check of like, tell me what it does on linear regression before we go and apply it. And actually this has been uh, about half of the papers that have come out of my group uh, over the last few years have been some variant of this. It's like, what happens in linear regression? What's interesting is oftentimes what linear applying to linear regression tells you is it tells you actually what's going to go wrong when you apply it to the complex nonlinear case. And you can actually trace that ahead. Again, that's not a theorem. This is just kind of like a, a, a somewhat guiding principle towards investigation in machine learning. Because in machine learning right now, there's a lot of complexity. And so trying to find things where you get rid of the complexity before you go back to it, it's, it's, it's worked well for me. That's what I think. And for these other folks who are awesome. Um, so this is my simple example. This is the one I want to use to motivate. This is one where I really want to say, what happens if we get, it's, it's simple. I'll give you this. It's simple, and maybe it's too simple. Maybe it's not indicative of nonlinear behavior. But it's the first thing I'd like to say is, if I don't know A and B, how do different models, how do these different algorithms compare for this linear quadratic variable? So we don't know A and B. 
So we don't know A and B. I can generate n trajectories of length t with whatever inputs I want. And the question is, how well can you do? OK, so. Oh, see, I, I moved. I shouldn't have done that. There we go. So uh, the motivating example of LQR, and actually, I want to look at LQR on these. Yeah, go ahead. How well can you do in terms of approximating the true world model parameters or the yeah. optimizing the problem? The optimizing the problem. That's a great question. That's a great question. Actually, it's going to come up on this slide. So the thing that's cool about LQR, the other thing that's really important about LQR is that I actually know what the optimal solution is if you knew A and B, which is another thing you want in machine learning. You want your comparator to be reasonable. So I actually know, if I know A and B, actually, there's a really nice solution for this. It's on an infinite time horizon, the optimal solution is to take your state and multiply it by a fixed matrix. And it was a really cool punchline that just is there. Is. Take your state and multiply it by a fixed matrix. That's the optimal solution. You can find that fixed matrix by a variety of techniques. Um, the, the, the straightforward way is called solving an algebraic Riccati equation, for what it's worth. But it really is. It's just that there's a straightforward way to compute that k. It is static. It does not have to look at the history. It just looks at the current state and then applies a, uh, a control ut. So that's really, if you knew A and B, that's the solution. And so an obvious strategy, this is the model-based strategy, is I would estimate A and B. And then with those estimates, plug, those, plug in those estimates into the formula and get K. That's an obvious strategy. And the question is, how well does that do? A less obvious strategy would be to take ideas from, from online learning or machine learning and try to directly apply those. So here, here's like an epsilon greedy strategy. The question is, how does this epsilon greedy strategy apply to this other idea, which is, in controls, we call, the, call that previous thing certainty equivalence. Is it, you, do, you do an estimate, you treat the estimate as true, and then you, you plug that in and use it forward. So the a kind of machine learning-esque approach, it's a bit of a caricature, but let me just write down what the character is. You first assume that you know that the optimal strategy should be linear feedback, linear state feedback, which is a big assumption. In some sense, you might call that a modeling assumption. But I don't, you know, people have different meanings of what that word is. And so what you're going to do is, let's say, sample a bunch of random vectors to do exploration, because we're in an online learning scenario. And I'll collect uh, samples by playing a current control guess. My current guess is k. And I'm going to take k, which is my current guess, add exploration to my trajectory, and that will give me a new trajectory. And then I'll compute the cost associated with this new trajectory that has all this noise on it. And then my update will be the new k will be the old k plus alpha t times the cost plus the sum of the noise times the state transpose. You might ask, how did I derive that? Yeah. The answer is, this is actually not epsilon greedy. I was lying. This is called policy gradient. And policy gradient is a very popular method that people use, and especially my colleagues at Berkeley, for some reason, I'm really obsessed with it. This is probably why I started looking at it. So <laughs> policy gradient is a very popular method. Uh, this is something, this is certainly what they are using to build these 5x5 five five, um, uh, players for this video game Dota. Um, I think it's used in a Everything at OpenAI uses policy gradient. DeepMind does a bunch of other stuff. Berkeley, also very mixed. But anyway, it's a big algorithm. People like it. Um, I think the one thing that, I, when we derived this, I tried to work it out, the thing I said is, like, I'm not, I've never taken a gradient of the cost. In some sense, people sell policy gradient as that's a feature. I never actually have to know anything. I don't have to take gradients. I just look at what states came out and multiply them by the noise. But as an optimization person, and Mark is grimacing, so I already know what's happening, that means that there's no gradients. So we have policy gradient is a derivative free optimization algorithm. It's a graded free method, but it's called policy gradient. It's the gradient of something, just not necessarily something you care about. Uh, and I think that's, that's the weird part about policy gradient, is that the, it might not actually be a gradient of something that's useful for um, this problem. And so when we actually, from a theoretical perspective, we looked at whether or not policy gradient could be competitive with a model-free method. The model-free method, the dumb one I told you, which is just estimate and use that as if it was true. And it turns out there's a family of LQR systems where the model-free policy gradient method requires a factor of d times t more data than the model-based method to achieve the same performance, at best. Like, I can't prove that that's exactly right, but you could prove a separation. It's actually, the, the argument here is really beautiful. It's due to Stephen Tu, who is uh, one of my graduate students, and he uses some techniques from asymptotic statistics. And what this shows is, like, there is a, this is at best, the factor is d times t, and it could be quite worse. Um, but you could show a sharp separation. d here is just the number of states. 
maybe that small. T is the amount, of, the amount of time that you want the controller to work for. So the longer you want the controller to work for, the more data you have to collect. And that's troubling. And it's also true that, the, that for this particular problem, did you, did you account for the data used to build the model? No, it's the same thing. So in one case, you use data to build the model. You do, they do the exact same thing, which is you collect, what did I say? Uh, N trajectories of length T. They have the exact same access pattern. Okay. One of them, at the end, just builds a model. The other one does this policy gradient as it's going. And it, the, the, the model-based method is substantially more effective. In fact, you can't do it. From an asymptotic perspective, there's no algorithm that's better than the model-based method. The model-based method is optimal for this LQR problem. Um, and then you might ask, well, OK, that's just theory. What happens in practice? Well, if we go back to our friend, the quadrotor, um, I ran, we ran, well, actually, I, this is my code. It's terrible. Uh, I, I coded up a version of policy gradient. This is actually the second iteration. Uh, after I initially posted it on my blog, someone from Google kindly pointed out that I wasn't doing things correctly, or at least not that the way current people do it. So adding his tweaks, I think you had to do something called baseline subtraction, and then you have to switch from, you have to add an atom solver to the end of things. I did a couple of things, and then it got better. And what you see is that eventually, after 30,000 samples of the system, you can actually get a mean performance that's on par with the optimal possible performance, again, because we could compute the optimal. But the variance is still very high. So the, blue, the shaded blue region here is kind of the variance. Uh, it's actually the worst case performance, the best to worst. The thing that's really interesting is that if you do nominal control, which is just the certainty equivalence control, after 10 samples, you are indistinguishable. I, can't, I couldn't figure out how to make this plot because it looked weird. But after 10 samples, you're indistinguishable from all. So, 30, so it's a factor of 3,000 in terms of actual uh, data collection for a very, very simple model. And so now you guys are looking at me like, I heard reinforcement learning methods are going to solve uh, self-driving cars. I don't know who told you that. Don't listen. <laughs> listen, listen. Um, and lots of people have kind of used this claim before. And I'm presenting a, a bit of a, a weird an indictment here. Like, again, we, if we throw out models, we do not gain efficiency, which we were supposed to gain. We're supposed to gain some kind of extra expressivity, some kind of efficiency, and we don't. Um, and they, this does seem to be against a lot of what has been popularized. And I think the important thing to realize is that a lot of people throw this, this kind of sentence around. In particular, uh, Lance Armstrong said this when, uh, when he was having a press conference when he was under investigation for doping. So lots of people who might not be, you know, it's too, if you need extraordinary evidence, it's really only because your prior might be off. And I think that the thing that's uh, important is that um, there's a lot of evidence out there that a lot of these model-free methods might not be ready for prime time. In particular, here are two quotes from OpenAI themselves, which I really love. And I'm going to read them, because I, I love reading them. Uh, reinforcement learning results are tricky to reproduce. Performance is very noisy. Algorithms have many moving parts, which allow for subtle bugs. And many papers don't report all the required tricks. <laughs> Quote two, so come back. <laughs> RL algorithms are challenging to implement correctly. Good results typically come only after fixing many seemingly trivial bugs. Right? And that's fine for lab demos. That's not fine for my car. I think that's really kind of the important thing here. Like that can't be the case of something that we're going to go push the forward, the, the future on. If you have to fix lots of seemingly trivial bugs, first of all, I don't know what a bug is, and second of all, like, if only, like again, this is from the people who are telling us that this is going to solve everything. If they they say this, I feel like there's a little bit of a wariness in, in order. After this, shortly after this, uh, some folks from Montreal, including Duena Precup and Joel Pinot, released a paper called "Reinforcement Learning That Matters," which everybody should read. Um, and what they saw is that if you actually take stuff from these fellows at OpenAI, and for some reason most of them are fellows, um, anyway, but the, the, this, this team in Montreal, what they showed is that if you just took the, took the algorithm and you start changing the random seeds, so you just go to the top of your Python file and set the random seed to, like, I don't know, 1337, or whatever one you use, um, you get completely different behavior. You can get completely non overlapping behavior just changing the random seed in the code. And while that maybe should be worrying, but so, well, this is the plot that really killed me. This is where I was. Oh, come on. I want to see this plot. It's important. <laughs> plot. So the, the, the thing that's really important here is that if, you, if you're sensitive to random seed, you're sensitive to, you're sensitive to refactoring your code. And this is three implementations of the same algorithm by the same person. <laughs> three different GitHub instances. All right, so three implementations, same algorithm, same person. And they have three different behaviors. And that's crazy. 
That's crazy. So I think that that's this kind of thing. Like we certainly lose robustness when we get to these methods, and we lose efficiency. And the question is, what's the way forward? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. It does have to be right away. Let me tell you what we've been doing. It's not. I don't think it's the. I don't think it's the way forward. I just think that there we have some baby steps towards some of these problems that I think actually are quite interesting. I don't think it's the whole story. It's just like kind of part of the story. But I think there are a lot, lots of interest here. I think there's a lot. I, but I think the key is using models is super helpful. And figuring out how to incorporate those models is going to be super helpful. So what I want to talk about is how we actually deal with uncertainty and, data, and, and use data to mitigate uncertainty in optimal control, in particular in this case of, um, uh, in this case where we're using models. And so I want to talk about having, how we deal with using data to fix uncertain dynamics, how to use data to adapt to changing costs, and how to use data to deal with making sure that you never violate safety constraints. Okay. And all these things, I, I have like, we have one way to do, a way to mitigate these uncertainties for a certain class of models. Not everything, again, not everything, but for a large class of models. And this is kind of the things we've been playing. And the, the, our key idea is to find a new prioritization that turns these things into complex optimization problems. So let me give you a high level view again. I wish this is actually something a little hard to teach to people who have never who don't know control. I want, but for the control theorists who are here, I want to give at least a little flavor of what we're doing. And the flavor is using something that we call system level synthesis. And the idea goes like this: when you try to design a closed loop system, I have a controller. Now, now, now I've started being a control theorist. I have boxes and then flow diagrams. It's great. Now we've moved into control theory land. But all these things mean is I have signals. And the, 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 this is the thing I'm trying to control. And it's the, the controller is looking at the output of this system and then using that to decide what to do next. That's what all that box means. The problem is that like, now what that, that kind of, you can think of that as happening is it's like a matrix multiplication. So if I had an optimization problem, I have these things that are unknown, the states multiplying things that are also unknown, the thing I'm searching for. And so I end up with a horrible non-convex optimization problem because the u is a function of x. So everything becomes non-convex. The way to get around that non-convexity, and there are lots of control theorists that have come up with lots of ways to do this, and we have one. And I do not think it's the only one. It's just the one that has worked for us, is to abstract away this. We want to abstract away this kind of connection and look at a higher dimensional representation. And the idea is, rather than thinking of the control as actually looking at the x. You can actually, it turns out that as you can always write the state for, OK, let's see, let's be really precise here. If u is a linear function of the state, uh, and x, everything is linear there, then everything together is actually just a linear function of the disturbance. So I could write everything as a big linear function of the disturbance only. And so now everything is just, what are these five matrices? Everything can be written as, what are these five matrices? And this is what's called system level synthesis. And what's funny is that we're thinking about the signals in this higher dimensional space. Everything is only a function of this input E. And I can design these five matrices, and everything is nice and convex, because E is this error that I don't get to change. This is just given to me. And everything here is multiplying things I can't change. The variables are linear on the other side. That turns out to be the trick. And so you're kind of viewing everything in this bigger abstract space. You're viewing the closed loop system as a linear map from E to the internal signals. And essentially, the way that you turn that closed loop thing into something that you can actually run is that all I have to do to get the actual policy is to take x and go back to the error. Just invert x to go back to the error. And then apply this phi matrix to go to the u. And that's essentially how, what we'd actually implement. So that's our strategy. Now this is the accelerator. Let me try one thing. Let me try one thing. Never fix it. Let's try. Switch, switch, it, switch the USB C port, right? Clearly. <laughs> do, you have a, do you have a power cable with you? Yes. Just got knocked out of the wall. Yeah. Try that too. That will fix it. You think so? It will. Oh, wow. Okay. That was easy. <laughs> that was easy. I don't know. That was plugged in a second ago, too. Anyway, all right, we'll see what happens. So now, but now we have confounders. Ah, and nothing works. <laughs> so, there we go. Anyway. So, again, the whole idea here, like, the, I'd be happy to talk afterwards with anybody about how we actually do the, the details. But the main takeaway here that you want is that when you start with a problem that's formulated like this with the policy here, this is a non convex optimization problem. 
The system level synthesis problem is to abstract things such that you're looking for the responses from disturbance to X and U. You end up, the resulting problem ends up being linear constraints in A and B. And if you start off with polyto uh, polytopic constraints on where you want the state and the signal to be, like you want it to be bounded or you want it to be in some region, then those end up being polytopic constraints on the, on the system responses as well. So that's the kind of high level thing. What can this do? Uh, it, Man, it really doesn't like me. We'll be all right. So I think that the important thing is to say what it can't do, right? So the big limitation of system level synthesis is it forces us into a world of linear time varying systems with constraints. Linear time varying systems with constraints. For control theorists, like that's fairly general. It's fairly general. But there are definitely things we can't do. We are sacrificing generality. But out of that, we get a variety of nice features, including stability, um, uh, constraints on state, and a very high sample efficiency. And I don't know what, now it's really dead. I'm going to move back to the One more. Does anybody else have a, US, a Mac US um, HDMI? Okay. I have the exact same problem. Oh, never mind then. We're just in trouble. It's the new machine. Huh? No, no, yeah. It's the new machine? Does your keyboard work? Because mine doesn't. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> Tim Apple really has uh, <laughs> He's going to hear from us. <laughs> All right. Oh, man, is it really done? Yeah. I think you're done. I might be done. Yeah. Maybe I just got to get off that table, because that table is horrible. OK, so we'll see. We'll see. How much time do I have? Uh, 15 minutes. What's this? No, no, that doesn't work. No, I meant the, the adapter, for this dongle for the Mac. I'm going to do one more thing. <laughs> no, 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 you got it. Flip it over. <laughs> We're in business. No, no, what do, you, do you think it's down there? Uh, Professor Wood, is this your projector from NeurIPS? Is this the same projector? Same machine. Same, same machine. Machine. Oh. HDMI. Yes. What did you just do? It's fine. Thank you. No, Francesca, you killed it. Yeah, I didn't do anything. Huh? You, uh, did you unplug uh, it or? I don't know. Huh? One more dongle if you want. There we go. We're going to try one more dongle. We'll get there. I have a couple more slides. Over here now, let's see what happens. You're a little uh, now, now I don't have a clicker, so I actually have to touch it. Really it. All right. So what's the idea here, right? So so let me just skip ahead here. So for the LQR problem, <laughs> no, for the LQR problem, I think the, the thing that's cool is that, so here's an, a flavor of what you can do. You can identify uh, A and B using the data, right? You run your trajectories to identify A and B. Um, one thing that's kind of cool about what we can do here is that I can actually get now, instead of having asymptotic results about model-based methods, I can incorporate the fact that maybe I don't have a lot of data. So what I can say is that not only do I have a model for A and B, but I can get estimates for A and B with error bars. And you can get that either from first principles using large deviation, which was uh, large deviation theory, which we have looked at for this problem. It's actually very interesting. That, you know, understanding what your error bounds look like in dynamical systems is actually quite complicated. It's cool. Very interesting research problem. Or you could just run the bootstrap, which is totally fine, to get estimates on how, how good your delta A's and delta B's are. And then what you can do is try to synthesize something that works for all possible manifestations of the uncertainty. You, know, you could just say, I want to do something that will work for no matter what the error is, I want it to work. Now this problem, again, is not convex, because we have these delta A's and delta B's. But the system level synthesis approach actually allows us to not only get uh, something that you can solve efficiently, but something where we can actually prove machine learning type bounds, so that the rate of error goes down as a square root of t. And it's kind of optimal with respect to how the system parameters are. What's also cool about this is it tells you I have a cost that's on an infinite time horizon. The co this, and this says I can run forever and have finite cost, finite average cost. Which is really cool. I mean, this is basically telling you that you have something that will hopefully be reliable. And to give you a, just, a, just this is a 
not a real example of how I would model heat exchange, but it's funny. So we're just going to go with this, these models of, I have some sources, and they're like heating up. So this is kind of a heat equation with some stuff moving across to each other. The important thing about this model is not the relationship to data centers. Really, the important thing about this model is uh, the relationship to identification and control. So you have these diagonal elements. Those diagonal elements are bigger than one. If you let this just run open loop, the system will blow up. Right, because you take that matrix to the power, and it's going to eventually go to infinity. Um, now, if I were estimating the system, maybe I estimate one of the diagonal entries to be 0.99. And if I'm trying to show off in the press, I want to minimize the amount of U that I use. I want to like minimize my efficiency. I'm going to try to really aggressively not use control, because the less, more, less control you use, the less you're saying how energy efficient I'm being. You're more energy efficient using less U. Now, that's dangerous. and. Uh, I actually had a lot of conversations here about that. that they don't, if you don't tune your LQR cost properly, you can run yourself into this thing where you're very not robust. So if you estimate one of the nodes as being unstable, uh, as being stable but it's unstable, and you're being too aggressive, you might end up with an unstable model. And this is actually what does, and this demo actually is what happens. So if you take that certain equivalent stuff, which asymptotically is fun, after 600 samples, looks really good, kind of the best model. But when you're really data poor and you're not accounting for uncertainty, the certain equivalence actually has, you can't see the orange here, but that's huge error bars. And in fact, out of 100 samples, more than half of the time is returning a controller that is unstable, that will crash the system. Whereas by, by, by now we can also incorporate this kind of safety and this robustness, and at very low sample budgets, have controllers that, okay, their cost isn't perfect, but they're stable. And now we can use those do a little bit more identification, collect a little bit more data, and improve our models, and then move into this regime where we're actually able to be both safe and have high performance. And just because uh, I am a, a, a computational person, I also ran this model with the model-free methods, and so I had to blow up the x-axis by a factor of, a th a hundred, of 10 here. Sorry, just a factor of 10, not that bad, to fit everything on the same plot. Uh, but at this point, we have things that are policy gradient. I could never get to converge to have finite error bars. But even other methods that are actually not bad, like LSPI, which is a method that's based on uh, approximate dynamic programming, that actually it's a, it's a very nice, has a lot of theory. But for these problems where you don't have, you don't, you're not taking safety into account, has very poor for performance on these kinds of problems. Okay, so we've done a lot of other stuff. Which is this is actually kind of taken over the group, which is fun. Um, but we've done we've done some work on adaptive control. We've done some work on how you actually do safe exploration, and we've also done one thing that I just want to kind of end with. Right? I, ha I said sometimes these things on linear models do extend to nonlinear models, and the question is like, do you, our model base our mo so for very complex nonlinear models, you might say, well, it's too hard to estimate the model, and maybe it's going to be too hard to actually control things this way. So what happens when you turn to nonlinear models? Well, the first thing is that policy gradient is still bad. Um, in particular, we had, we had a very nice paper at NERPS last year that was led by Corey Mine and Aurelia Guy, where they, they showed basically that really simple random search, just the, these simple things that do finite difference approximations, uh, far outperform other methods for RL on kind of the RL benchmarks that people would release. Um, but they're still not great. Like, you saw that guy running. <laughs> like, that's not actually walking. And so like, even, like the, even though very simple things with static linear policies are totally fine, and you don't need neural nets, and you don't need policy gradient, it's still not really great to directly try to optimize a controller without thinking about the model. So in some other work by Emo Todorov and, and, and uh, his collaborators, they were actually able to show that like, model predictive control with a very coarse model of, of the walking robot could actually do, I mean, that's, it's slow, but it looks like sensible walking. I think the thing that's interesting about that is that that video is from 2012. Mm -hmm. I don't understand how we forgot about that. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, Emma actually wrote Mujoko, so he's actually the guy who's like, you know, he made the demos. And yeah, so it's still like, even though people are excited about these demos, and there are lots of people out there still writing lots of nerves papers about these things, none of them outperformed this thing from seven years ago. I don't really understand. This is just, we're in a bit of a frenzy right now, right? It's the machine learning frenzy, sometimes you gotta run with it. Okay, so the conclusion so far is that model-based methods, in my experience, do seem to perform better than model-free ones. 
And you can show that both in theory and practice in a variety of cases. Models are really powerful, so that if we're going to throw them out, we really need a good reason. I haven't found it yet, but I'm still I'm really willing to listen to hear why that might would be useful. Um, and I do think that like one a big one is that's really important is reinforcement learning needs to find some baselines where we can really agree and really start to dig in and understand. I want to close with two thoughts. I have time to close with two thoughts. Good. Two thoughts. Then moving on. First is, what is machine learning actually good for in control? I feel like the problem that I was solving today, which was the problem I was told by lots of people in the RL community to solve, is not really a problem that most people I talk to who are building robots have. Most people who, have, who are building robots know how their robots work. They know the models. They have good simulators of these robots, and they can make them work. But they do have some issues, right? They do have some issues. For example, how to incorporate perceptual data? Hard. And just because you have a camera doesn't mean you have to forget about the fact that the robot is governed by physics. I think that's important. Um, it sounds obvious, but I think it's incredibly important. It's, it's incredibly important. Um, and so what is, what is machine learning good for? Machine learning, because like, there's a reason why everyone's excited about it. It is legitimately really powerful for non-parametric prediction. Making predictions about stuff, we're really good at this. And this could be in detecting images, uh, putting bounding boxes around things in images. And this is kind of like the basis of a lot of stuff that's in cars now. Uh, doing machine translation, doing machine translation coupled to vision. This application is one of the craziest things I've ever put on my phone. It's amazing. Um, it doesn't work quite that well, to be fair. But close enough. <laughs> close enough to get around in a lot of places. And it works in Japan. I mean, it's, like, it's pretty cool yeah. how powerful that is. And certainly it powers the backbone of a lot of things uh, online. Everything kind of with machine learning prediction. So the question is, like, where do you need prediction in control loops? One answer is when you have perceptual sensors. So if you have cameras, or even it turns out that a lot of really a lot of the fancy sensors for tactile sensing end up being like cameras. Like you'll have a gel on a fingertip-like object, and then you'll take a picture of how the gel deforms. So you do have this kind of like image recognition type problem. So using figuring out how to really couple the power of comnets with class control, that's a hard problem. We don't know how to do it. It's a great problem. And the other one is forecasting. If we can build good time series forecasts, no matter what you're using, and I'm, I'm, I'm very, like, there are lots of different ways to do prediction of the forecast. How you actually incorporate those in efficient ways to do real-time control is another thing that I think is a really important and interesting direction. That, like, these are like real problems that would really kind of dramatically change the way we do um, automation. And so I think like, that th th those are two really important things that I think machine learning can help with in control. The other thing is that I think that whether we call it reinforcement learning or control theory, or I tried to pitch this other one, I like actionable intelligence just because nobody has claimed anything. I think the study of how you use data to enhance the future of manipulation of dynamical systems is hugely important for machine learning. And it's actually something that we don't do a very good job of in machine learning in general. We tend to teach machine learning as I have data, and then I'm going to use it to make predictions about essentially data that's the same. All of our work that we do when we teach when we take machine learning, okay, this is at the undergraduate level when we teach machine learning, we always thought there's a training set, there's a testing set, and then there's some new set out there in the future, and everything is distributed the same. But we know that's not true. We know that's not how the world works. And in particular, um, we're using those ideas in machine learning systems now, and there are weird consequences. So if you think about a recommendation system, the way that these things tend to work is that you take data from everybody who's used the system before, and I build some predictive model, and I make these amazing Discover Weekly play playlists that I enjoy every week. Or maybe I recommend YouTube videos to people. But then what I do is I look at what people actually click on after I serve them some of these things, and I retrain. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden, I went from this nice static machine learning thing to something where I introduced a feedback loop. And it turns out that basically every machine learning system that's out there that is sending data to our phone and to our laptops and, uh, and to our cars is actually a reinforcement learning system. And we just didn't realize it. So in some sense, I think that's the other reason why I think it's really important for us to understand these problems, is that machine learning has, itself has to understand how you incorporate these dynamics and how you kind of mitigate some of the side effects of these dynamics that we actually have seen. Like I thought when, when I started working on recommendation systems, whenever that was, <laughs> many years ago, and you talked about the Netflix prize and all that kind of thing. It just seemed cute. But now we know that like, it creates, like, it radicalizes people. 
it drives us all crazy. And that's like, that's like not something we were talking about in 2009. But I think it's something that's really important to talk about in 2013. So I'll just end with that. I think that the, there are all these exciting problems, both in taking machine learning and throwing it back at control, but also taking these, these views from control and feedback systems and thinking about what does that actually tell us about machine learning and how to fix some of the stuff that we're already deploying. I think these are really exciting problems. And I'm excited to work work on them moving forward, and I'm excited to hopefully talk to you about them and help you can also maybe collaborate with me on. That would be awesome. Thank you so much. <laughs> Whoever brought up this adapter is my hero. Thank you. Um, <laughs> talk to him about the uh, control stuff. OK, good, good, good. Um, so we're almost at 3. If people need to escape, Ben's going to close his eyes. You can just run. No, no, I'll, I'll, get, I'll, get, I'll get out of the way. Okay, uh, and then I guess like we're not really time limited here, but we're, we're like, we definitely have some time for a few questions. We will have to go to the airport at some point. At some point. So, so, so my understanding, and I, I only took one undergrad course in controls, but is that control systems? Uh, Reinforcement learning, the thing about reinforcement learning, it can solve problems that are much more ambitious than these kind of control methods. So, and that's why I'm, I find it fascinating. So is there some way to scale up these yeah. methods to tackle those large problems? Yeah, this is a great question. So this is actually something that I, I, I've been trying to get my head around, too. Because if you look at the kinds of things that, for example, like I, um, through this study, I met Francesco Barrera. He's here with me today from Berkeley. And you watch the videos of him skid parking RC cars. It's crazy. And it's a, these are amazing demos, and there's no machine learning. And so I think that there's a bit of a disconnect there, too. Boston Dynamics, those, those videos with the robot that's doing backflips, no machine learning. And so there is this weird thing where controls itself does some crazy, amazing things. Reinforcement learning does, too. Go is, like, that was a breakthrough. It's a huge breakthrough, and it was really impressive. So it's not, I'm just saying both of them are tackling complexity just in very different ways. And I think maybe figuring out what one is good at versus the other, I think is probably the way forward. Thank you. Yeah, I'd just be interested in hearing your comments on the, the model predictive control, because uh, yeah, it's, um, I, I know EMOs work well, and so it, it's a super cool result from, from 2012. And, and uh, but to, so to what extent, I mean, the model predictive control approaches, they, they typically take a trajectory and then they'll do some local optima there. And so, you know, EMO has the magic fingertips. Yeah. To, 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 you know, yeah. the MPC methods have to search as well. Yeah. And so, you yeah. know, that's a detail that's kind of swept under the oh, carpet. Yeah. And so, you know, so if, if you try to get that character to, to, to set up some other specific reward function to do something else, then then oh, yeah, it gets real happen. challenges. Absolutely. So, uh, so yeah, any, any thoughts on that? On, on because both the standard RL, yeah, no, I think, both I think policy gradient methods and and the MPC methods, they need to explore, and so they they, they don't have whatever. I mean, MPC works great when you have like a, a well shaped local minima, and uh, and of course the, the policy gradient algorithms will, will hit will find yeah. local minima as well. But yeah, any, any thoughts on? <laughs> yeah, no, I think it's so. So Russ Tedrick uses model predictive control for walking robots, but he does this thing where they actually predict where the contacts are, and um, every time that you have a contact, you get a you, you get a branch, and so essentially he's solving branch and bound in real time on an Atlas robot, and it's crazy, and it's hard, and like they basically, their Drake platform that comes out of Tedrake's lab, you have to write templated C++. Like, it is not accessible, and that's a huge fault. That is, that is a, a you, I think, the other thing that's amazing, again, the thing that's amazing about reinforcement learning is not just the optimism, but it's how the tools have become approachable. Like you can get something and run, if AlphaGo maybe you can't do, but um, like you could train something that gets pretty good at, uh, I guess, maybe Shogi, or is that too hard too? There's some that you can actually train with your own computers. I can't remember. I know you can't learn. Uh, the one, uh, anyway, there are some that you can. But, but right, there's an immediacy to it that's really powerful that you could just get it, you could run it, and you don't have to, to learn too much. Whereas if you actually wanted to run the algorithm that Rust does, you have to, first of all, learn how to write templated C++ code, and I haven't done that in a really long time. And you have to learn a lot of stuff about dynamics. You have to learn about mixed integer programming. It's all of a sudden all this crap that has to come, come to the table. So I, I agree. I think that's, I don't know. So th this is now a bit of a philosophical question. Should it be that hard? Probably not. Is there a better way? Probably even there, yes. And I don't know how we kind of push those two worlds closer to each other. So it's not a great answer, I'm sorry, but like I was just saying that there is, I, it's undeniable that it's a real problem. Yeah. Um, so you, your conclusions are based on the assumption that you have a great model. 
right? Often that's not the case. Yeah. Uh, so is there uh, some place between model-free okay. methods and yeah. model-based methods? Yeah. Yeah. Perhaps? Great question. Great question. I love this question because there are two answers. The first answer is in the Mojoko stuff, you have a simulator. You have a model. So every Mojoko demo is running a physics simulator. There's a model. I just have to look at the code. So that's the first thing. I really want to emphasize that. But Bouchon knows that. I think the important thing, though, is there are lots of times that you don't. You have these irreducible error signals you have to estimate. And that's kind of what I was talking about in this slide. And I don't know how to do it yet. But this thing, where I have a model, the part I know, the physics I know, and then I have the stuff I don't know. Like kind of weird forecasting elements that are just additive extra terms. And I've seen a lot of really interesting and promising work that adds things here. Like, for example, in, in walking, uh, the Ames lab at Caltech does this thing where they can, they, they, let's say you want to have a, a, a robot that walks on rigid surfaces, walk in sand. It actually uses um, Gaussian processes, they use Gaussian processes, you can use whatever you want there, to actually learn about the properties of the sand to correct for that error. Um, that another team at Caltech has used the, is used neural networks to actually characterize how, if I have a quad rotor and it's flying close to a surface, it stops being Newton's laws, characterizing what that error looks like as you get near the floor. So I think that there's a lot of potential there. And understanding the biggest problem that, that you have there is one, how you bound, how do you actually make it uh, understand what that uncertainty is doing so that you can do robust control. And the other one that's hard is that typically it really slows down your control policy to have the neural net there. Because even though neural nets are faster for inference, uh, linear systems are faster. So, so that's the, the, those are the two things. You have computational challenges, and you also have just have challenges of understanding how to uh, manage the extra uncertainty or understand what the uncertainty is in that neural network. But yes, yeah, so I think that's a super promising direction. Uh, so about the robot thing, so we are talk, you are talking about the Boston Dynamics controller, which is designed to control. But from my understanding is that uh, it requires a lot of manual tuning that's model free. Like PD control, they like to tune the PD game manually, and that's model free. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. and well, we, we will oh, argue man. that tuning phase <laughs> in simulation using RL might be like less manual labor and more automatic. Oh. Uh, do you have any comment on that? Yeah, so what I know, again, this is limited, is a lot of time when you have actuated robots like that, that are a little bit under actuated, when you, you have these signals, they're there's another problem that nobody likes to talk about with robots is that like in these control models, you get to specify you. And on the robot, that's just some voltage that hopefully gives you the right torque. Like you're supposed to specify torque, and I just like give it something. And you hope that that works out. And that's bad. And that's why you add these PD controllers. Yeah. And so you have PD controllers almost at any place that you actuate to try and correct for the fact that I'm not actually, that the signal that I'm sending to this is not actually what I wanted to send. Um, I've been told that the tuning of that isn't that bad. <laughs> but again, I'm going to defer to my friends here about, I think there's expertise that comes along with that. I mean, like they, they, I, it's, I've been told that that's not as hard as finding a good learning rate for SGD, but I don't, I mean, again, this is a little bit farther from, from, from my expertise. But uh, yeah, I think this is a complicated thing, because the other thing with RL is like, there are so many tuning parameters there too. Like, comments at this point for image processing problems, especially if you take, if you're just fine tuning, that kind of works out of the box now. RL does not. It's not, we're not at the state where RL works out of the box. You can get it to work. In a lot of cases, especially for games, you can really make it, like I think the demos are really robust, but for control problems, it does not work out of the box. Um, and I think that's still, so both of them have that kind of, that, that subtle issue. Are you watching the time? I am. OK. Yeah. Go ahead. Talk, talking about models which are uncertainty aware, yeah. can you comment on the difference between robust MPC and Bayesian RL? Oh. Uh, now we get really in trouble. <laughs> 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 we get really in trouble. Oh, boy. Uh, comment how? What would you like me to say? <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, like the, I think there are two different ways. I say, so typically, actually, the, I think the real thing to say here is that typically, so you can do robust, robust MPC with probability. the 
Bayesian methods really want to incorporate probabilistic uncertainty throughout the execution. That would be, I'm sure there's some way to combine. I mean, I guess there are these methods called like, like scenario based that kind of try to do, to get at the middle there. Yeah. I don't know this as well, this guy knows. <laughs> In terms of the complexity of the system you like to control, I guess, um, so when you have these, the physical systems, right, laws of, phys laws of physics, you, you have the model underneath, then you want to, de when you deal with the society, let's say, why do they make these decisions? Why do they drive over this bridge? Then there seem to be two different types of systems to, to control. And then in climate change, right, you, you have everything combined. You have the, the physics of the atmosphere, right, to get climate, but then you have policy decisions. So there might be some systems where, right, there might be a fundamental limit to if you can actually impact it in a way you want. You can always impact them, but you might never get to, to a desired outcome. Um, so I wonder if there is some, I don't know, theory or people thinking about, maybe I can even measure it if I get my, if I measure my system and I can make a statement about, well, controllability type of thing. Um, oh, two comments. First of all, I do find I, something I, I don't, I haven't figured out how to really negotiate well. I really don't like talking about social systems and control theory in the same sentence because they start to sound really scary and authoritarian. Mm -hmm. I don't like that. But I do think that control theory is really good about thinking about dynamics and uncertainty in dynamics. And so maybe we just need to call it social dynamic systems. We'll call it that, and then, we'll, then I'll feel a little bit more comfortable with the next part of what I was going to say. Um, what I've found, because I've been trying to talk, I've been talking to people at tech companies about this. I mean, it seems like the trickiest part is actually the you you, I, um, you hit the nail on the head here is measurement. Measurement is one of the hardest parts. So like these control systems all kind of assume that I can, so it's not controllability, it's observability. The control systems all kind of assume that I have this process and I could estimate the state eventually. And I think a lot of times, like with the internet systems, like you, people optimize for time on website. Because clearly the more time you spend, the happier you are. Um, you know, the more delight you're getting from the website, right? They, I think I had someone told, tell me that once, and then we had the conversation, and they changed their mind. But I, I think that like it's like there is a certain uh, there's a certain like even though they can collect a ton of data, they still can't really measure. Like data collection is not measurement. It's, just, it's complicated. So I think that that's something that we all that we're really interested in understanding, and that is kind of related to the same thing with cars. It's like if I want to drive a car, what do I have to measure? Cameras are incredibly expressive. They have millions of pixels now. But to actually drive, I mean, we all know it when we actually drive. I'm not sure how much observation we actually need. <laughs> we have a working lizard brain to drive. <laughs> so I think that they're actually very related, these, these, perceptual, these issues about perception and how perception makes its way into a kind of um, uh, control system. I, I know that's hand waving. I do, think that, I do think that measurement really does seem to be the big key in all of those, climate change included. All right, why don't we cut it off there? Thanks. So let's thank let's thank Ben again.